Tonight on the 21st of Jumada al Thani in the year 1444, corresponding to the 12th of January 2023, we are in the book Keshf al Shubuhat. <clears throat> Uh, the explanation of the removal of the doubts by Sheikh Al Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab on page four hundred uh, on page forty five, starting subtitle five, people's methodology regarding the meanings of Uruhiya. Bismillah. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi. <coughs> Brothers, they asked me to go slow, as in that we don't want to go fast and we understand. Kashf al-Shubuhat, first of all, it's not a book which is difficult. It's the, the meaning of the book itself. It tells you that we want to dismantle all these doubtful matters which is being thrown onto us, Ahl tawheed from the people of shirk or the people who do not know about tawheed, even they have good intention. We want to dismantle their arguments and how to refute that and how to immunize our result. This is the whole thing about the book. It's very easy. <clears throat> and the fifth paragraph will emphasize that as well. So we're going to do the paragraph number five. But we we'll just give an introduction. Remember, we have divided the book into four segments. First one, which is the category of introduction. The introduction of the sheikh is a lengthy one, and we have given it 11 sections. So in the first introduction, 11 section and we are at the moment in the fifth section of the first segment do you understand me the fifth section of the first segment what's the first segment in introduction of the imam the second one was to refute the doubtful matters and the doubtful matters are here he mentioned nine so we're going to doubt by doubt what they have said and how can we encounter it then the third segment of the book is that is some of those proofs that they are uh, ob objecting on us, some of their proofs, how can we tackle their proofs, some of those proofs. And then the last thing, which is the, the conclusion, where the Imam, rahmatullah he would show the importance of Tawheed and how it is a pillar for you to enter paradise. And he has uh, told us to concentrate and focus upon it. So we are now, we are in the fifth segment of the, of the first fifth section of the first segment, and that is, we're going to read it again. Brother, people's method, people's methodologies regarding the meaning of ulu here, and what is intended by this testimony is the actual meaning which it conveys, and not merely its pronunciation. The ignorant disbelievers knew that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam meant with this testimony that Allah alone should be singled out with all worship and devotion while disbelieving in everything else which is worshipped besides him and forsaking this. For indeed, when the Prophet ﷺ said to them, La ilaha illallah, they responded, <clears throat> Has he made the gods into one god? Indeed, this is something beyond belief. So if you recognize that even the most ignorant of the disbelievers understood this, then it is even more amazing that some of those who claim to be upon Islam do not understand the explanation of this testimony. What was understood by the ignorant what, what was understood by the ignorant disbelievers? Rather, he perceives that it is enough to pronounce it without believing in the heart anything which it in which its meaning indicates. And the shrewd from amongst them thinks that it means no one creates, sustains, or disposes of the affairs except Allah. <clears throat> there is no good to be found in a person when even the most ignorant of the disbelievers are more knowledgeable of the meaning of La ilaha illallah than him. Right. This title for this segment, or this section of this first segment, we're giving it to Imam is talking about the people's understanding in the meaning of al-uluhiya la ilaha illallah no god worthy of worship except for allah alone you remember yes, last time we've given you two proofs from the qurans remember two verses yes i'm just asking you do we mention so that did we say dhalika bi anna allah huwa al-haqq wa anna ma yad'una min dunihi al-batil the other one dhalika bi anna allah huwa al-haqq wa anna ma yad'una min dunihi huwa al-batil did we mention this Yes, we have mentioned. Do we talk about the Jamaat al-Tabliq and their interpretation of La ilaha illallah? Uh, I believe. 
no, no, no. I'm just saying one person. Yes, yeah. So this title of this segment is basically how the people differ about the meaning of la ilaha illallah. He's saying the smart of them who says la ilaha illallah means there is no creator but Allah. There is no running of the affairs except for Allah. There is no one who is the one who is the supreme God except for Allah. There is no one who runs the affairs except for Allah. I mean, if that was the meaning, then the kuffar of Quraysh would have no problem to say la ilaha illallah. Do you understand what his author is trying to say to you? If that was the real meaning of la ilaha illallah, Abu Jahl would have said, okay, la ilaha illallah. No problem. For no la ilaha illallah. Because he believes that there is no creator except for Allah. وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَقُولُنَ اللَّهِ Allah says, if you to ask these kuffar, Abu Jahl and the likes, who had created heavens and earth, they would say, no doubt, it's Allah. They believe that Allah is the Rabb. So what is that thing that they refuse for it to say, La ilaha illallah? Yes? To be worshipped. The only deity to be worshipped. That is uluhiyah. That he is the one to be singled in worship. They said, and that's why they said, أَجَعَلَ الْآلِهَةَ إِلَهَ وَاحِدَةً did he make the gods that we are worshipping? Allah, 360 gods. Did he make them all in one god? I mean, this something is absurd. Can't believe it. So they believe that the god who is creator of all of those little gods uh -huh, is Allah. But we have to have these little gods because they are the ones who are going to be well, taking us to the real god. We don't worship these little gods except that they will get us closest to what? To the real God. So they believe that those little gods by, are created by God. But you don't single God in worship. So when they slaughter, they slaughter to Allah in order to get them to Allah. They slaughter to al uzza in order to get them to Allah. So they took intercessors or mediators, the ones who are mediating between Allah and the people. So here he says that the people regarding la ilaha illallah had differed. Number one, he who knows the meaning of the word, yet he does not implement it and he does not single Allah in the worship. And those are the kuffar and the mushrikeen, for they validly they know the complete meaning, and but they are stubborn and they are following their oh, you know, forefathers, <coughs> and they don't single Allah Azza wa in their actions. So those are the kuffar like Abu Jahl and the likes. And we say to them, had it been that the only knowledge to know that the that, that the just to know the word is enough, uh, okay, then the Prophet ﷺ would have never fought them. Okay, he would never have fought them because they did not implement the tawheed. But he fought them actually because they did not implement it and they have been doing shirk. The second category, did you put this uh, doubts about that? The second category, he who knows La ilaha illallah, that is to be just parroting the words, la ilaha illallah, regardless of his creed, regardless of his action. And this is what we said, al karamiya you remember? The ones who say in the Islam is just a kalima, to say it with the tongue. Man qala la ilaha illallah dakhala al-jannah. And so many proofs to dismantle this argument, saying that for verily, then the munafiq Abdullah ibn Ubayyid salul would have been what? A worshipper. He would have been, because he said la ilaha illallah, to come to the masjid. So yet he was, in the helper, in al munafiqina fi dark al asfali min al Yes, and the third category, the ones who are more than that, they say awluhiya is the same as the rububiya, and there is no difference in between them. Okay, and this was a sha'ira, jahmiya, the rafida, al baqiniya, al quburiya, all of those sufiya, and we said that we could really refute their argument. That is mushriki, the Arabs. They used to. Uh, confess with the Tawheed al rububiya but they did not confess with the Tawheed al uhiyah If the meaning was to be together, then their Allah's message would have never fought them. Also, Allah Azza wa Jalla, when He says, "Qul a'udhu Rabbil Falak," ha, min sharri ma khalaq, and "Qul a'udhu bi Rabbil Nas, Malik al Nas, Ilahi al Nas." He said, "Rabb, Malik, Ilah." So, Rabb, Rububiya, Malik, Asma' wa Sifat, Ilah, Uluhiya. So, in that surah. Allah mentioned the three categories of Tawheed. What are the three categories of Tawheed that we need to learn? Al-Rububiyyah, Al-Uluhiyyah, Al-Asma' wa Sifat. 
Rububiyyah, most of the people, they believe in it. That Allah is the Rabb, Allah is the Lord, Allah is the creator of heavens and earth, Allah the one who runs the affairs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the one uh, that does run everything. But the second category, Al-Uluhiyyah, which is to single Allah in worship, which we call it Tawheed Al-Ibadah, Tawheed Al-Uluhiyyah. And the third category, Tawheed Al-Asma wa Sifat, that all the beautiful names and the attributes belongs to Allah, the one whom Allah described himself with and named himself with, and also his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right. طيب, let's go now uh, to the following segment. Public. So if you understand with certainty of the heart what I have mentioned to you, no. and you understand the reality of shirk associating partners with Allah, about which Allah said, to focus. Yeah. 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 about which Allah said, no. in Allah <laughs> Certainly Allah does not forgive the partners that are associated with him, but he forgives whatever is less than that for whomever he wills. And if you understand that the religion of Allah, with which all of the messengers were sent from the first of them to the last of them, is the only religion that will be accepted by Allah. And if you understand that the majority of the people today have become ignorant of these things, then you will, in, then you will attain at least two great benefits. The first, to appreciate the blessing of Allah and His great mercy, as Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala says, Say, it is by the preference of Allah and His mercy, in that let them rejoice, for it is better than, than what they are able to acquire. Another benefit that you may gain from it is that it causes great fear. That's it, not great fear. Just finish the power. Because you understand that an individual may disbelieve with the utterance of a single word from his tongue. No, no, this is just up to here. Great fear. Up to this. Close the sentence, and this is the sixth segment that we're going to be elaborate into the introduction. Right, so we're going to give it a title, and that is to rejoice by knowing the Tawheed and the opposite of the Tawheed, a proper knowledge. So the knowledge or the knowing of the Tawheed and the Opposite Tawheed, a proper knowing. So he says, the author, if you knew the meaning of La ilaha illallah, a proper meaning, a correct knowledge, and also you knew the opposite of it, which is the polytheism, shirk. So you know the word La ilaha illallah Tawheed, and you knew the shirk. Okay, then will this will make you to have a great rejoice. A great rejoice. Why is this rejoice? He says you can have a rejoice. It will give you number two, two things. One of them is what? Al-Farah. <laughs> now, uh, there are a verse which is in the Quran, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah, la yuhibbu Allah does not like the one who rejoices. No, no. This one rejoices in kufr. With Allah he is happy for those who rejoice to know Tawheed, to be on the Haqq. It's a different rejoicing. This rejoice, the reason because it, because you have known Islam, a proper knowledge, and you have known the opposite of Islam, the proper knowledge. So you've known Islam, proper knowledge, which is Tawheed, and the opposite of Islam, which is Shirk. And this should be a cause for you to be over rejoiced. Because you have got the correct knowledge. Now, this correct knowledge is Tawheed of La ilaha illallah, which is the greatest of all things. And this is a bounty, a blessing from the Almighty. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should be rejoicing. As Allah Jalla said, Qul, say Muhammad, bi fadlillah, with the, the bounty of Allah, which is Tawheed, wa bi rahmati, with his mercy, fa bi thalika fal yafrahu. Let them rejoice with that. طيب. So we're rejoicing now. That we are knowing the kalima. Now, I will be happy if I knew that everybody is upon mashallah to him. How about that is if it's me only or few people of us who know the tawheed and the rest they don't know it. Your rejoice will be better. Why? Because alhamdulillah, I am not from those lots who do not know the tawheed. I am wrong from little. And that's why Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, 
uh, Allah Jalil said, وَقَلِيلٌ مِّنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورِ Very few from my people are the one who are thankful to Allah Azza wa Jal. And also, Allah Azza wa Jal, also he said, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ And most of them, they believe, but they are actually, they don't believe until they are مُشْرِكِينَ وَمَا أَكْثَرُ النَّاسَ وَلَوْ حَرَسْتَ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ And so many people, O Muhammad, they will be not believers, even you are keen to make them believers. Most of them are what? مُشْرِكِينَ So the Prophet ﷺ, when he came and he's a prophet, how many people believed from him, uh, in him, on his message? The ones which are the lost or the few? Few. The ones who have believed in him, much, much less than the one who had disbelieved in him. And so you, if you are from those who have little believed in the Prophet of Allah, believed in the word, that should make you rejoice and over rejoice. So the people who are on the earth now, majority of them are not believers. And if they are believers, they're not put, they're, they don't know the category of Tawheed properly. And that's what a reason for you to rejoice. Secondly, that you rejoice because you have been safe from this false creed that other people had fallen into. So you are safe from the evil, from the batil, from the shirk, alhamdulillah. So first rejoice because I know the kalima Tawheed. Secondly, I'm safe from the batil. Thirdly, I would rejoice because I became from Ahli Sunnati wal Jama'ah, from the people who follow the Sunnah and the people who are around the Sunnah, which are the Jama'ah, from those who call Ahl Tawheed, the people of Tawheed, the people of Ahl Hadith. You're not from those people from Ahl Shirk, those are the people from Ahl Qubur, the people of the graves, they worship the graves. You don't know how many people go to the graves and worship the graves? I mean, now these days, you could see it with your own eyes at the time. They don't know it, they've heard about it, or they, some of them they see it, but very few. But now, <clears throat> with a click of a <clears throat> button here, <laughs> Google, it will give you how many people from the Muslim. They have shirk. Haven't you heard about the dance of the grave? From those people who can, you know, read Fatiha, they read Qul Allah. Have you seen it? Just put Manchester, or put Oldham, Oldham, it was Oldham, Oldham in Manchester, dance grave there in YouTube. We'll show you. People are Muslims saying the kalima, la ilaha illallah, yet they are dancing in the grave. And after that, they sit next to the grave. After that, they sit next to the grave and they themselves, they will start reciting the, the last 10 surahs of the Quran. Qul hu Allahu ad also in Qul Arbul Falaq. And they're doing shirk. And they are then doing the shirk in the name of Islam. SubhanAllah. So that, as I said, the author, he said, he, rahimahullah, he wanted to add, or he wanted, he intended from this segment, which is the sixth one, that is to combine between knowing what is Tawheed and also knowing what is the opposite. So if you knew that, alhamdulillah, because some people, they know Tawheed, but they don't know Shirk. Or he knows the Shirk, but he doesn't know Tawheed. Or he knows the Tawheed, but he does not implement it. So the Rejoice, it should be in the following. That is to know both of them, Tawheed and Shirk. So he knows the Tawheed, and he knows the meaning of the Tawheed, and he knows the borders of Tawheed, and he would implement Tawheed. So, and also the other side, he would know the Shirk, and he would know the meaning of the Shirk, and he would know the borders of the Shirk in order for him to leave it. I repeat that again. The person who rejoices is the one who knows the Tawheed, he knows the meaning of the Tawheed. He knows the borders, the limitation of the Tawheed. So he would implement it. And at the same time, he would know as well the shirk, which is the opposite. He would know the meaning of it. He would know the limitation and the borders of it in order for him to leave it. That's the one who would rejoice. And that is the meaning of that sixth segment of the first session or the sixth session of the, whatever you want to call it, this one. It is from the introduction. We go now to the seventh one, part one. I'm going to put it part one because it's the only one sentence and I need to shed light upon it because it might create a confusion. Father. Because you understand that an individual may disbelieve with the utterance of a single word from his tongue. He might say it out of ignorance and yet he may still not be excused for his ignorance. That's it. I put this segment seven, part one. But there's segment seven, part two as well. But I put this because this is a great matter. Al-Udhru bil-Jahl. To give excuse 
due to ignorance. <coughs> Are you going to be excused because of ignorance? Let's say that you have made a tawaf round the grave. And the person doesn't know. Is he excused because of his not? You know, he doesn't know. Do you understand that? Is his knowledge? Uh, somebody is talking, Ikhwan. I don't know. We had in class. Can I just ask him if they're talking? Just to stop talking. Like Allah. Right. So the title I'm going to give for this is that is ignorance or misinterpretation an excuse or it is not excuse regarding major shirk? Shirk al-Akbar. Now this is one of the very difficult matters in Tawheed. And we need to contemplate into it slowly. Like Tabar did ask me to do slowly. I'm going to be extra slowly with this. Um, we need as well to supplicate to Allah. That Allah Azza wa shows us the haqq regarding this issue. And before we start tackling this issue, you need to know that when he, the author talked about this, he did not intend this subject. It's actually, he just brought it along, okay, so that he had, you could say, flew off tangent, all right? Um, so it's like he had made it there as a statement to scare you off. That is, if you said a word, and it's a word of shirk akbar, you will not be excused for saying this if you even if you said it with what? With ignorance. To scare you off. It's a very scary statement. Because we want to see that does the Imam believe that the person will not be excused because of his ignorance? Do you remember the hadith that I number time mentioned here? Where a person be excused for a major kufr? Anybody would like to share that with me? Yes, Tabal? The one that uh, was in the desert. He lost his camel. Well, okay, so he remembered something which I did not mention before, which is a good one, a good example. But this person, he did not do kufr out of ignorance. He made kufr out of drunkness. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But he knows. If he knew, he would have never said it. You remember that person he's talking about is the person who was in the desert and he had a camel and he had his uh, life support in it, which is food and drink. Suddenly the camel lost, which, you know, when you lose your camel in the desert, you lose your you know, life support line. That's it, you're finished. So this guy started looking for it and he gave up. You know, means he's surrendering to death. He went to the tree, shaded himself. While he was like this, camel suddenly come in front of him from nowhere. So he took hold of the top of the camel and he sat, he said, out of extreme joy, extreme joy. This is called drunkenness. You know, you're drunk because you are extremely sad. You're drunk because you are extremely joy. You're drunk because you are really drunk. Okay? You don't know what you're talking about. So this one is drunk out of extreme joy. He said, Allahumma anta abdi wa ana rabbuk. He wants to thank Allah. He said, you are Lord, you are my slave and I'm your Lord. But he doesn't realize what he's saying. Akhta'a min shiddat al He made a mistake of, out of extreme joy. And this is to show that how Allah is happy with the repentance of his slave, that he is more happy with your repentance when you repent than that man who is happy to find his wife, his lost camp. But this is not to do with a person who had been excused for his ignorance. Father. Well done. So that's the one. This person, he is muahid. He's monotheistic. He's a person. Who believes in Allah. Now the hadith says that this man gathered his son when he was about to die and he said to them if I die okay, burning and burning is number one major sin because at that time from the time of Adam alayhi salam he will bury him. There's no burning. Burn me. And then take my ashes. Scatter them. Half of them in the land half of them in the sea. The sons were faithful to his uh, to his will, they did it the same. But he said the following words. Why? He asked his son to do this. This is a word for word in the hadith. In Sahih al-Bukhari. Allah's message is quoting his words, which he said, if Allah was able to do this on me, why is able? They mean doubting the capability of Allah. Allah is able to do this to me. That is to punish me. That Allah is order, was able to gather me, to bring me back. He would have punished me. A punishment, he never punished anybody 
before. That is clear kufr. No doubt about that. If you said this with you understanding the meaning of it, you're a Catholic. So this person happens to die. The sons were faithful to the will. They burn him, scatter half of his ashes in the land, half of ashes in the land. Why is that? Because he wants to make it difficult for Allah to bring him back. That's what the man thought. Then Allah Azza wa Jal says to his particles, be so and so. And there he is, in front of Allah. Why did you do that, my servant? He said, oh Lord, khashyatuk. It's not, I've done it because I don't believe in you, other God. I don't believe that I've taken other gods to be worship you. No, I am fearing from you. And because his fear, it made him the extreme fear to think that he might get away with it. Because he was doing some sort of sins. He was scared, but nothing to do with the shirk. But he did say the word of kufr. Allah, he forgives him. Scholars, they said, and this is a very strong hadith. Number one in al udru bil jahl To excuse you with what? For ignorance. He was ignorant. And when you have ignorance, I remember I say all this time, when you have ignorance plus fear, it's a lethal recipe. It will make you to worship anything. Do you understand me? So when you have ignorance in India or part of the Asian continent, with fear, they started worshipping any art. He's worshipping tigers because they fear him. And they have ignorance, they worship, uh, they worship anything. Because they fear and ignorance, lethal recipe. But those people are not monotheistic. If they are monotheistic, muhirin, and out of ignorance had done this, Allah will excuse you. You have to differentiate between a person who is a disbeliever, that's such an excuse, a disbeliever from the origin, does something kufr, we don't say, we give him udr bil jahl, the excuse that they, have, that they are ignorant. Otherwise, we can't call even the mushrikeen that the Prophet of Allah was sent to, to be what? Mushrikeen. When they ignore them, it's called Asr al Jahili, the year of ignorance. But they call in them, we call them what? Usan. We call them what? Mushrikeen. These are the Mushrikeen. Even they were ignorant. When the Prophet came to them, they were ignorant. But we didn't say, we can't call them Mushrikeen because there is, could be a possibility that Allah will let them uh, buy because of their ignorance. No, they are Kufar. But when you become Muahid monotheistic, then if you do the shirk, okay, we say that this is shirk, what you've done, this is kufr, but to make this person is a mushrik or a kafir, something else. So a Muslim rotating around the grave is doing shirk. A Muslim who's prostrated to somebody else, that's shirk, shirk akbar, major shirk. But does he have an excuse for ignorance? Of course. If he was ignorant, who had prostrated to the Prophet Sallallahu Ya Ismail? Ya Allah, anybody? Huh? No, no, for the Prophet Muhammad Muad ibn Jawad. He went to be like a sham. And he went, he saw people, mashallah, prostrated to another out of respect. It's a good thing. I can't find anybody more respected than the Prophet of Allah. As soon as he came to the Prophet, he prostrated him. Did he say to him, Muad, you are a kafir now. You need to go and wash and say the kalima to enter Islam. <laughs> he didn't say that to him. He said to him, what made you do this? Then I went to be like the Shah Messenger of Allah and I saw people prostrated to other people and I thought that you are the most deserved to be prostrated to. So that's why I did it. He said, no. That no one is to prostrate except for Allah. And if I want to command anyone to prostrate to anyone, I would have commanded the husband, sorry, the wife to prostrate to her husband. But that means I will not, I can't, because the only prostration is to Allah. But you show the greatness of rights of the husband over the wife. I would have commanded her to uh, to prostrate her, but it's not allowed to prostrate except to Allah Azza wa Jalla. So he did not call him kafir or shirk, but he called his act as shirk. This is kubur. But because of the excuse of ignorance. And lots of that, lots of stories like this. Otherwise, we're going to make every person such, such an act. You are a kafir. You are a mushrik. So we say that the author, he did not bring this as in to state he did not intend the whole subject when he said that statement he wanted just to scare you off and also uh, 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 he is talking about the kafir or the jahil the ignorant who does not say la ilaha illallah do you understand that he who doesn't say la ilaha illallah we, we don't give him excuse of the jahil which i have explained just now okay so if you are a kafir 
You're not a Muslim. We don't give you an excuse for this shirk. So we don't say, otherwise we're going to make the Christians and the Jews. Well, they're ignorant. We can't call them mushrikeen. No, we don't do that. Um, so we're coming back to the root of the matter. Does the author uh, uh, regard the excuse by ignorance for the Muslim is a matter that we should take on board? Of course. Al-Imam, rahimahullah, he had stated that number of times and I'm just now going for you to something that the Imam Rahmatullahi Ali, Imam Abdul Wahab, he had said it regarding this issue he says verily Arkan al-Islami khamsa the Islam has got five pillars this is the words of Imam Muhammad Wahab the, the first ones are to the two shahada well, the first one is the two shahadas, and then the rest of the remaining four arkan. If he is to confirm this person, these arkan, these pillars, uh, and he had left them out of negligence, then so you're not talking about the, the, the shahada, talking about the four, the other four, which is salah, siyam, zakah, and hajj, those four. So if he left them. Out of negligence. So even if we to fight him because he left them, like the Prophet Abu Bakr had fought the people who did not pay what zakah, we do not make takfir upon them by abandoning them. Look at that. This is Imam Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah. And he said, but as for the scholars, they have differed regarding one of those pillars. What is it? The salah. No. La ilaha illallah salah. So we said the first one shahada, you have to say it. So once you said it now, the other four pillars, if you have left them out of negligence, not out of denial, if you left one of them out of denial, there is no prayer, there is no zakah, then you're kafir. But out of negligence, that means you believe in them, but you did not pay your zakah. You believe in them, you did not pay your, pray your prayer. You believe in them, you did not fast Ramadan. Do you understand? I mean, you believe Ramadan is compulsory, but you did not do Ramadan. You did not fast it. Isn't it there are lots of Muslims that don't fast Ramadan? Isn't it or not? Do you call them kuffar? Do we bury them in the cemetery of the kuffar? Where do we bury them? In the Muslim. Unfortunately, there are Muslims give their own Muslim daughter who prays to somebody who does not pray and does not fast. True or not? We, just, we treat them as Muslims. And they are Muslims. Because they are leaving it out of negligence, not the leaving it out of what? Denial. They don't deny it. You know, they, they say that it's Allah, Siyam, Zakah, Hajj. But they don't do it out of, because they are falling short. Criminals. So here we say, Imam al Dhabi said that if he had left those four pillars, not the fifth one, which is not the first one, shadow him. If he left them out of negligence, then even if we fight them for leaving them, we are in Islamic state, we will fight the person who does not, for example, pass. Okay, put them in prison, for example. We do not make that fear upon them. But the scholars differed regarding whom? The one who leaves the what? The prayer, the salah. That's it. Is he kafir, the one who does not pray out of negligence, or he doesn't? This is the only matter that the Salaf differed about it. Uh, we believe the correct opinion is that he's not a kafir. And there's lots of proofs for this. But there is on the other side who believe he's, what? he's a kafir. There's lots of debates between us and them. Okay? But then they will not call us murjia, nor we call them what? Huh? Huh? Yeah, khawarij, khawarij. So we don't call them khawarij, takfirin. Well done. So we don't call them khawarij, nor they call us what? Murjia. That means they don't call us, for example, the we water him down because we don't make him kafir. And we don't call them you are extreme, kafira. You are putting these people kafir because they left the, the, the prayer of the night. No, this is the difference which is established. And we approve it. There's a difference. Yes, we say they are wrong. And they say to us, we are wrong. Okay, but we're still together. Our Sheikh Ibn Baz, he's a kafir. Our Sheikh Al-Albani, he's not a kafir. But we love both. We love both scholars. Rahmatullahi alayhim. And this was, as I said, the case for number of era of scholars. But most of the scholars say he's not a kafir. As I said, this is not here the time to establish which one is correct. The one who says, the one who leaves his prayer out of laziness is a kafir or not. It is not. Fine. So this is Imam Ibn Wahab, he says. And he said they have differed regarding the one who abandons his prayer out of laziness, but without denial. And we do not, listen to this, make takfir, except 
upon the person whom the uh, uh, the scholars, all of them, they agree that he's a kafir, which is the what? Shahadatan. So he says, and we do not make takfir except upon which all the scholars had agreed upon that if he left it, he's a kafir, which is what? Shahada. shahada. The two shahada. First pillar, two shahada. This is Imam Luhab. Imam Luhab is attributed to those who are in Ahl Najd. The ones whom they pick, they believe that Imam al Wahhab who says that Imam al Wahhab he says the one who leaves his prayer out of legend is a kafir. No, he doesn't say that. And that's established in his book. Yes, he's had other statements where he says he's a kafir, but I'm just saying that we, we can't say he's a kafir except what his scholars had agreed, consensus, and he's a kafir. And that's the shahadatin. And that's it. Leaving the shahadatin. Fine. Um, now, we're coming to, to in this point, we're still in this point. We say, now, he say, we say that uh, if this person uh, had been given the truth and then he denied it, then we could say the kafir. And we will say that we are uh, saying that our enemies, our opposers, okay, with us on a number of issues. Let's talk about these issues and say who is the kafir and who is not a kafir. First type, he who knows the Tawheed, monotheism, is the religion that Allah wants us to be on and his prophet wants us to be on. The one that uh, says that the uh, worshipping the stone, worshipping the trees, worshipping the people, okay, uh, that this is shirk. So these people who knows the Tawheed, is the religion of Allah, okay? And he had confessed that believing in the tree or the stones or the human being, okay, is the religion of most of the people, that this is to be shirk in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the shirk which the Prophet Allah was sent for, the shirk which Allah imposed upon the prophets to call the people to abandon, okay? And he would fault his people uh, uh, for all of them to submit to the will of Allah, that all the religions for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? So, uh, and he knows the shirk. So this person, this person, if he, this person, did not leave that shirk, and and he, he imposed upon that shirk, and he believes this is correct thing, that's no problem. We All of it, all of us, we say that he's a kafir. So we are agreeing with our, our opposers. He, the person who knows the tawheed, and he knows the shirk, yet... He indulged into the shirk and knowingly and leaves the tawheed knowingly that he's a kafir 100%. Second time, he who knows that, okay, and he also praised at the same time the people who championed the shirk, the people who worship the people, the people who prostrate to the idols. And he did not abandon that shirk. I would say that he is even greater in shirk than the first category. This person, he knows the Tawheed, like, but at the same time, he approves, okay, uh, that those people, he actually praises those people who commit the shirk, then he is a person also is a mushrik. The third category, the one who knows Tawheed, and he loves the Tawheed, and he follows the Tawheed, and he knows the shirk, and he abandons the shirk, okay, but... He hates a person who enters the hate. And he loves the person who stays on his shirk. He is also a kafir. The fourth category, who is safe from all of that, but his people, his land, his homeland, all of them, they are declaring their enmity towards the monotheistic people. And also they declare to follow the people of shirk. Okay? And... Uh, 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 and, and he does not leave them. He stays with them. And he gives an excuse. Well, this is my homeland. This is my people. So he is with them even when they fight the people of Tawheed. He is with them when he when they line themselves with the people of Shirk against the Punitistic people. Also, this person is a Kafir. Why is a Kafir? Because that's not an excuse. Why are you fighting the people of Tawheed? And you know your people are upon Shirk. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Right, coming back now to the second part of the seventh segment, 
And he says, Al Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahab. He might say it, <coughs> he might say it mistakenly, thinking that it will draw him closer to Allah, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, just as the people of Shirk believed. More specifically, if Allah has granted you understanding of what he mentions of the story of the people of Musa alayhi salatu was salam, while it is a true while it is true that they possess righteousness and knowledge, but still approached him demanding <coughs> make for us a god just as they have gods. So at this point, a person's fear of this and eagerness to avert this and anything similar to this will increase. Okay, this is the second part of the second section of the first session, which is or first section, that is Muqaddimah. The second part is the title for it. It is incumbent upon the person to be on extreme fear, continuous, continuous fear from falling into shirk. So here the author Rahimahullah brings the story of the people of Musa alayhi salam. What is his target by mentioning the story of Musa alayhi salam? His target from the story is that to show you it is important for you to or incumbent upon you to fear from the shirk. For very the person might fall into the shirk while he doesn't know. So even even a righteous man can fall into the shirk while he doesn't know. Even a knowledgeable scholar he could find fall into the shirk while he doesn't know. So here that's what he said that especially, he said, especially if Allah had inspired you with what Allah said to us regarding the story of the people of Musa alayhi salam. With their righteousness and with their knowledge, yet they came to Musa and said to him, what? Make us a God like those people of Fir'aun. They have a God. Make us a God. And you remember what the companions have done as well when they just embraced Islam. And that is in the Fath Mecca, the regaining of Mecca. Just about a month and a half, the Prophet was heading towards Hunayn because the tribe of Hawazin and Faqif gathered an army to fight the Muslims. And this hadith, hadith Abi Waqid in Layfi in Sahih al-Bukhari, he said, Islam, both is correct. Both, we were to sort of recently left the ship. We are just recently embraced Islam. That he's saying to you, whatever you're going to find later on from my story, please have an excuse for us. Because we are just recently embraced Islam. Then we went to the Prophet. Remember when they went, they were the 10,000 who had already came from Medina to Mecca. And those are the ones whom their heart is full of strong iman, proper aqidah. But along with them, there are 2,000 who just embraced Islam. The ones who had embraced Islam when the Prophet of Allah regained, they call it conquered Mecca. Those 2,000 is where the problem happened with them. So they went with this army. They were 12,000. This is the biggest army so far that the Muslims had. Now, also, those people are newcomers to join the Islam. They never had an army like this. The maximum army they had is in the Battle of the uh, uh, Trench, which is not as, as big as this. So they went in the vast land like this. Oh, they looked at each other. And said, we will never be defeated because of our great number. That's why Allah wanted to teach them a lesson. The number is not the factor for victory. No. The factor for victory is Iman. The factor for victory is Tawheed. <coughs> and then they pass by a low tree. It's called Datu Anwar. A tree well known to the Arabs, to themselves, before they embrace Islam. A tree where the Kuffar, whenever they want to go to the battle, they will hang their souls into that tree and they will do a ritual during the night before the following day to fight. And that ritual is to dance and drink and, and so on. And at the same time, that dance and the drink is not as big of a sin than their belief that hanging the swords from that tree will reboot or they reboost, okay? Will give them a charge. So these weapons now will be extra mighty, extra killer. That's what they think, extra sharp, okay? So these to believe in that. That belief is worse than the drink, worse than the rituals of the dance because it's a shirk. 
So the Muslimin who had just embraced Islam, they thought, no, this is shirk, because this is the tree belonged to the Kuffar. So they wanted to have now a, a Muslim tree, a, a Muslim tree, not a Kafir tree. So they passed by another exactly the similar tree in terms of typewise, lot. You know the lot? Lot tree. You don't know the lot. <coughs> okay, well, Google it. Share Google will tell you the lot. It's like a big tree. Uh, uh, sorry, um, what do you call it? Sidr, 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 Sidr. Shajar Sidr is what in Arabic, in English. Shajar to Sidr. The, that one, low tree. It's in English, I think, low tree, isn't it? Low, yeah, low. Uh, the, the, the leaves of it, they use it as well for a number of things. Even they use it for Rukia. Okay? Warahu Sidr. They use it even for soap, nice smell. So they pass by another tree. So they want this tree now to be blessed by the Prophet. The Messenger of Allah. Make us a low tree. Like they have a low tree. Like the Kuffar, they have a low tree to hang their weapons. Make us a, a Muslim, a monotheistic tree. So we could hang our swords on it. So we could have our swords as well as mighty as the Kuffar. So the Prophet, وسلم, he said, Woe to you. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, that means what a nonsense as well, you say. And sometimes you say, Allahu Akbar. MashaAllah, something which had stunned you with beautifulness, with Iman, but say sometimes Allahu Akbar on something which is kufr, on something which is bad. Allahu Akbar. Qultum, you said, Walladhi nafsi biyadih, by the one in whose hand is my soul. Ma qalat banu, is Mus, uh, banu, Mus, is banu Israel li Musa alayhi salam. What the children of Israel said to Musa alayhi salam. What did they say? Ij'al lana ilahan kama lahum ariya. Make us a God, like they have a God. So asking for a low tree is asking for another God. That's the shirk. That's the kufr. So here the musannif, the author, he had said this thing to make the fear of shirk extreme in your heart. It's incumbent upon you to be fearing the shirk as much as you fear to fall into a ditch that will kill you. As much as you fear to find, let's say, a crocodile just, you know, sprinted upon you from the swamp. What would happen? Wouldn't you see a crocodile? Oh, you run. Same thing. You should be as scared from the shirk. Because he said, those people who said to Musa, alayhi salam, that give us, make us a God like that. They are from the noble people. They are people, righteous people. They are, some of them are knowledgeable. Those companions who said to the prophet, make us a low tree, like they have a low tree, they are companions. But yet they fall into the shirk. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ had told us a dua. Allahumma inna na'udhu bika an nushrika bika wa nahnu na'lam. Wa nastaghfiruka lima na na'lam. He is the Prophet who said this. And then Abu Bakr, he is the one who rated this hadith. He just, and he used to say that dua. Oh Lord, we seek refuge in you to commit shirk in you while we know. How can we make shirk in you while we know that this is shirk? We seek refuge in Allah. But the thing which we don't know, wa nastaghfiruka, we seek refuge in you that for the shirk we fall into, while well, we don't know. Abu Bakr is saying this dua, and he is the head of this ummah, the most knowledgeable after the Prophet. He's asking Allah forgiveness. If I fall into shirk, what well, I don't know. And this is called Udr bin Jahl. It's called what? Udr, an excuse because of what? Ignorance. I'm ex I, I, excuse me for my ignorance. I didn't know that this is shirk. So even the Muslim can fall into Prophet he said, الربا إثنان وسبعون أبابا والشرك مثل ذلك ربا is 72 types and shirk likewise if I ask you how many types of shirk do you know how many riba would you know only two, maybe up to 10 and that's it so there are lots of things that the people commit they don't know if it's shirk so you have to fear the shirk I say that's no problem no fear the shirk that's what the author is after so here he the sheikh rahimahullah he had warned us to fall into what majority of the people fall into. The one who had said, La ilaha illallah, but they said, for example, La ilaha illallah, there is no one who is created except for Allah, the one who is the one who nobody invented except for Allah. Okay? So they have given a wrong interpretation. No other Muslim had understood it properly from those Muslims before. Even the mushriks, the Prophet of Allah fought them, they did not understand that. False meaning, which is only, okay, they understood la ilaha illallah means tawheed al-luhiyya. That's why they didn't say it. Okay, that's why they didn't say it. Otherwise, if it was just tawheed al they said, okay, la ilaha illallah. Let's go to the eighth, please. Oh, sorry, 
Plato does such that it is incumbent upon the person to be on extreme fear or continuous fear from falling into shirk. Okay? That's the number of Number eight. I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his infinite wisdom did not send a prophet with this tawheed except that he appointed for him enemies. As Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍّ عَدُوٌّ شَيَاطِينَ الْإِنسِ وَالْجِنِّ يُوحِي بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَى بَحْضٍ زُخْرُفَ الْقَوْلِ وُرُوعًا And thus we have made for every prophet an enemy, devils from mankind and the jinn, inspiring one another with eloquent speech of delusion. And it could be, and it could be, and it could be that the opponents of Tawheed possess knowledge of many sciences, books, and evidence, and evidences, as Allah Tabaraka wa Taala says. What did you put? What the verses? Where the verses you put them? MashaAllah. I want to see how you put them. Oh, agree then. Yeah, yalla. فلما جاءتهم فلما جاءتهم رسلهم بالبينات فرحوا بما عندهم من العلم. And when, the, uh, and when their messengers came to them with clear evidence, they rejoiced because of what they possessed of knowledge. If that's, you... that's it. That's the eighth segment from the first section, which is the introduction. And the title for that, Every Prophet Has Enemies. And these enemies, they have proofs as well. So this is the title. And the summary of this title, or the summary of this uh, this segment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made for every prophet enemies whom they have enmity towards him and those enemies they are all the time in, inject shubuhat doubtful matters around him they all the time <coughs> fight him they fight him by throwing doubts into the minds of the followers of those prophets so each prophet, Allah Jalla, he had made for it enemies. Those enemies, their task is to uh, fight and resist the call of the prophets and to throw shubuhat. And here the author had, alhamdulillah, indicated uh, onto something which is very late. He had shown us that it is from the wisdom of Allah, from the hikmah of Allah, that he did not send a prophet except he had made for him a enemy from the ins and the jinn. Why he started with the ins, the enemies from the from the human being, not not with the jinn, uh, because the ins, you know, they come to you in a way which is you could see it as a sympathy. It could come to you as a sheikh. Yet he's an enemy. So the enemy from the ins is even worse than the one from the jinn. She can come to you that in a way that you accept him. He looks like, mashallah, yet he wants to put what? Doubt into your mind. And this wisdom of Allah Azza wa Jal to make enemies for the Prophet is actually, that is to, because the enemy, when it is with the haq, it will distinguish the haq. So when you, you have something and the opposite of it, that thing will become stronger in your belief because you have what? The opposite of it. So the opposite so you, you believe in loving the police because there are criminals. Do you understand me? So the criminals are against the police. So when the, there's a criminals and the police are against them, you love the police because they are stopping the criminals. The same thing here. So when you have this prophet and you have the enemies and the prophet is to fight the enemies and the enemies is to make your doubt about the prophet, your strength in Iman and the prophet, what he comes for, it becomes stronger. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made for the prophets he had made also for the followers of the prophets. So the followers of the prophets, what happens to the prophets happens to them. So there are enemies to the scholars who follow the prophets to throw out doubts into the minds of the people. And that makes you more in love for those followers of the prophet. More in love for those scholars who are the ones who are going to show you the path of the haqq. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, had created the evil for hikm, for wisdom. That evil is to, had it been for Iblis, we'll, maybe we'll not enter paradise. Fighting Iblis makes it to go out to Jannah, gaining Jannah through fighting Iblis. Tayyip, those criminals who are the enemies of the prophets or the enemies of the followers of the prophets from the scholars, okay, they bring two things. Number one, enmity. Number two, doubts. Enmity by fighting and doubt by the words. So 
they, they, the enmity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the enmity towards the Prophet وسلم, and also throwing doubts against Allah's verses and against the calling of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will guide the Prophets and he will guide also the followers of the Prophets and he will uh, aid them uh, against their enemies, even they are uh, uh, stronger than the enemies, but Allah will aid them as well on top of their strength. So we should not be in despair for having too many enemies. You know, if you look at yourself as Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, you are little amongst those who are deviated. The deviated groups, I'm not talking about the disbelievers. Oh, that will be, you'll be compared with them, nothing. No, there's no comparison. But I'm talking about the Muslims. The deviated ones are much more than the ones who are guided. So we should not be in despair from the number or the great number of those enemies. And we should not even be in despair of this lengthy, uh, could I say, time for not having victory. Because we know the destiny is ours. Always. The destiny is always for the pious people, regardless of how long it's going to take. Remember the prophets, how long they stayed, stayed until they got the victory? Remember the companions and after the companions? These people have a, a, a big story, as well, a big followers in the role model of those companions. of Fight. The enemies of the prophets, um, the ones who argue with them, the ones who belie them, uh, they, they, you could have lots of knowledge in terms of, uh, you know, extra knowledge in terms of dunya, and they could maybe have as well the books of shubuhat, and they call it these shubuhat as to be proofs, they're not proofs. They might make the people confused between Haqq and Ba'dil. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said regarding this issue, فَلَمَّا جَاءَتْهُمْ رُسُلُهُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ When the prophets came to these people with the proofs, فَرِحُوا uh, 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 they, they, have, they have rejoiced, okay? Uh, rejoiced. And they rejoiced because they rejoiced with something which is what Allah is not pleased with. So this is called rejoicing from the criticized rejoicing. They have rejoiced, these people of the kuffar, the enemies, a rejoice which is not the rejoice of the believer. So the author, Rahmatullahi Ali, by this uh, paragraph, he is one to show us that the people of uh, the shubuhat and doubtful matters, that uh, they have a weapon of shubuhat, they have a weapon of enmity, but Allah Azza wa Jal, with his hujjah, the proof one, he will dismantle their hujjah. Prophet ﷺ, when he said Mu'ad ibn Jabal, if you remember, to Al-Yaman, and he said to him, you're going to be coming to people of the book. So be ready. You, they're going to throw onto you shubuhat, which is from the shubuhat of Ahl kitab So you should know that how to encounter their shubuhat. Um, so the a'da of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have three things. Knowledge, they have books, and they have proofs. Okay? And now, in these days, the methodology or the methods by which the enemies of Allah throw the doubts upon us are too many. SubhanAllah. The media, we have even uh, conferences, universal conferences taking place in order to how to encounter Islam. Um, Allah Musta'an, you've heard about this uh, conference that took place or the meeting between uh, 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 the, the Sufis and the top of those, you know, kuffar. You've heard about this? There was a conference between the Sufis uh, and, and there, there was in the front lines. All of these people who are against Islam, they were with them. These Sufis are willing to cooperate with the disbelievers in order to tighten the screw onto the real Muslims, which is the Muslims who follow the real La ilaha illallah, the ones who negate that belief of the Sufis, which the Sufis say that La ilaha illallah means there is no creator but Allah. We say no. That is no deity worship, worthy of worship except for the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Last and last finally, you go to the ninth, please read. If you have understood this and you know that the path to Allah will always have enemies and opponents upon it, people who elo who people who possess eloquent speech, knowledge, and evidence, then it is incumbent upon you that you learn enough of the religion of Allah that will enable you to arm yourself with a weapon that you can use to confront these devils whose leader and chief said to Allah, لا أقعدن لهم صراطك المستقيم ثم لا آتينهم من بين أيديهم ومن خلفهم 
وعن أيمانهم وعن شمائلهم ولا ولا تجد ولا تجد أكثر أكثرهم شاكرين. <coughs> I will surely sit waiting for them upon your straight path. Then I will approach them from before them and from behind them and from their right and from their left. And I and you will not find most of them to be grateful. But if you turn to Allah and pay close and pay close attention and pay close attention to His clear proofs and evidences. Then do not fear nor grieve. Because Allah said, "Inna kaidah shaitani shaitani kana waif." Indeed, the plot of shaitan has always been weak. That's it. This is the ninth session, which is the last one we're going to be discussing. Okay. We leave the two, inshallah, for next time. So here, the title of this session is that it is uh, important for the person to have the weapon of knowledge in order to face the enemies, the enemies of his deen. Importance to have the knowledge in order to face the enemies. The cream of the crop is that there is some of the knowledge that is incumbent upon you to learn it in order to refute those shubuhat, those doubtful matters. And this is, we call it the knowledge of arudud, the knowledge of refutation. So the Musannif, when he said, if you know this, that means if you know that these enemies, they have books, knowledge, proofs, by which they make the people confused regarding which is true and which is untrue, which is haqq and which is batil, then you have to be ready for them. And being ready is to be, number one, is that what the author had said, you have to have some proofs from the religious proofs, from the intellect proofs, by which you could repel and re refute <coughs> those uh, uh, proofs being thrown at you from the Ahl al batal from the people of Batal. The second thing is that we should know the Batal that they have in order for us to refute it. Now, knowing the Batal, I don't read their books, but I would read a book from the Muslims talking about that Batal. If I want to know the Batal of Ahl al Qadianiyah, I don't read what the Qadianiyah say, say. I read what the scholar of Muslims said about the Qadianiyah in order to mute myself how to refute them, because if you're not knowledgeable enough and you start reading in the books of the Ba'atul, you might be affected yourself. You might carry some of their ideas. So, we say to them that we will, that the author says to us that we have to have these two things. Number one is that to know what is uh, number one, that to, to know that uh, the uh, uh, to have proofs, which is intellect proofs, are also uh, religious proofs, in order to encounter the proofs being thrown at you, or that the doubtful matters being thrown at you by these people. Secondly, is that to know what do they have from the Ba'atul in order to refute their argumentation. The Musannaf, he said, he has to have enemies. That means enemies for you, an enemy for your methodology, enemy for your da'wah. Enemy, something that those enemies by which the how they have opposed the scholars, or opposed their the way and the methodology of those scholars. Um, uh, the differences between them is that sometimes they have enmity towards you, but they don't have enmity towards your methodology. <laughs> sometimes they have enmity towards your methodology, but they don't have enmity towards you. Okay? And sometimes those people of Bata, they do both. And then the Musanif, he said, but if you go to Allah and you listen to what Allah had taught you from his proofs, and uh, 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 what he had given you as as an as, as a weapon against those uh, doubtful matters, then don't be grieved, don't sorrow. The author name maintains from this is that to encourage who is the one uh, a proper believer in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and he had knew the haq that is not to be scared from the proofs thrown at him by the people of falsehood, because their proofs are to be. They are to be weak because it is from the plot of the shaitan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, In the shaitani Valley, the plot of the shaitan is to be weak. Uh, so uh, uh, he said, because of the fear, because of, because of not fearing, sorry, of the Kaid uh, shaitan uh, is two, two, two reasons. So for you not to fear the Shayt or the plot of the shaitan are to be two. And inshallah, we'll discuss them 
in the next time. But let me tell you, see, Ibn Taymiyyah, he says, regardless of what false argument had been thrown at you from the falsehood, there is in the Quran a proof to encounter it. Not a single doubtful matter been thrown at you, except the Quran has an ayah, a statement, okay, which will dismantle it, which will show it is bottom. What is the proof of this? Allah really says, they don't bring you an example, except we brought something to dismantle. And then I'm going to give you the quotation of this verse, inshallah. Uh, let me just show you the verse what it is. Let me say that. <clears throat> ولا يأتونك بمثل إلا جئناك بالحق وأحسن تفسيرا سورة الفرقان verse 33 they don't bring you any sort of doubtful matter they throw it at you except we bring to you the حق to encounter it and even a better وأحسن تفسيرا this ayah tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran has brought you everything that you encounter some people they memorize the Quran and they know the verses, yet Allah does not inspire them to get the right encountering ayah to the uh, to dismantle that shubuha that that person is debating with him regarding it. So you find the person regarding uh, debating with you from the people of falsehood, and uh, uh, this person is half and he knows that verse properly, yet it doesn't come to his mind. Because he hasn't prepared himself. You have to prepare yourself. So if you knew that the Ahlul Batal is going to be arguing with you is people from atheists, then I know what are the verses to encounter the atheism. It's from the people of the book. I need to know. If it's Buddhism, I need to know. If it's Qadian, you need to know. Do you understand me? So I need to prepare myself. That's what the author is studying us. That basically you need to make sure that you are not scared from the proofs that have been thrown at you from those people of al-Batal because you have the haqq with you. The Qur'an in every single ayah of it, there is a refutation for those who are from the falsehood. By which, inshallah, uh, we conclude our talk and we give you the time for question and answer for another 20 minutes. Tadar ya Muhammad Zaman. No, I said, <laughs> I said you put your finger up. Because you said like this. <laughs> Somebody scratched his beard and I said, <laughs> Fine. I will go now to uh, if you have any questions. Um, uh, please, the question regarding what we have heard. Don't ask me prostration and ruku and sujud. Now, Did the enemies always motivate the enemy? Or is it always the enemy? Do the enemies know that they are enemies? Well, if the enemy doesn't know he's an enemy, he must be a person who's fool. But the enemies, they are deliberately are our enemies. So they are knowing the haqq uh, in their heart. And they are arguing to put doubts into your mind. Those are the enemies. But if a person who doesn't know is an enemy, he's a fool. Meaning like he is, he's out of his ignorance. He's being an enemy. You know, it's a, we call a person is an ignorant, uh, an enemy of himself. Because of his ignorance. He's arguing. With, okay. So if he's a person genuinely, okay, and he's not an enemy to me, but he's arguing with no knowledge. This person, I, I would say he's an enemy of himself. But I would say to him, hang on, Akhim, brother, where are you bringing your things? Is it that proof? Because always uh, the person, if he gets into too much argumentative, he might deny something which is even obvious hak for him because of argumentation. Because of hak the nafs, he wants to prove that he is the one who's a winner. He takes a debate as a wrestling match. As long as I beat you, regardless of what uh, correct proof or not proof, as long as I'm a winner. So I would, I would, I, he's a person enemy of himself because he had made the shaitan to embark upon him. But I'm talking about the real enemies, the ones who know that this is haq. They know, they don't want to follow it. So they want to put doubt into your mind, doubt into your aqidah. Allah said, Ya ladina kafir. Allah said about these kafir, they love to, to, for you to commit apostasy. To make a apostate, to leave your religion. They love it. 
يرضونكم بافواههم تابا قلوبهم they please you with their mouth but their heart is not there and their heart they refuse you so whenever they have the opportunity they will put doubts into your into your heart okay so look at this don't look i'm just saying as an example don't look those websites which i call them that this, the, the, the the shaitan net huh it's in a shaitan net you fall into it they capture you slowly slowly how they drag you away from the deen and islam uh, uh the enemies of allah azza wa jalla the day and night they're working day and night they're always talking to each other. Deception, how to deceive, how to. Allah understand. One non Muslim, he was on TV, I can't remember ITV, BBC, a long time ago. And he said something, and I was amazed how, how truthful came from the mouth of somebody who's an enemy. He said, the guy, I don't know who he was, but he said, you know that what is happening and what is the West is trying to do. Is injuring and trying to do is actually uh, is to make sure that the Mus the Islam does not expand. He said that. He said that, and I don't know how how they made him. They didn't really even edit that sort of. They didn't edit it. So it, it's not to make Islam to spread to expand. He said it like this: is like what the West and all of them are trying to do together is to spread to make the spread of his. But you see, they are fighting the religion of Allah. It's not us who fight. fight. We are we are weak. This is what Allah wants. The religion of Allah means a religion that Allah wants us to, to have. So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's supporting this deen. It's not us. We find it's the most expanding and fastest religion growing in the world is Islam. But unfortunately, so many people, yet Allah's messenger, he said, Ghutha on Ghutha is sea. It's like the foth, the foth of the sea. You know, the foth of the sea? Nothing. You could see it big, but it's nothing. That is dirt with it and Allah Musta'am. Now, our, our Allah, Akhwani, we have a task upon us is to show these people that whatever they see as in the media, most of it is not correct. You have to prove your Islam with your actions more than your words. Prove it with your neighbors and all of that. Some people understand these days, alhamdulillah. And uh, yes, the media has, I would say, double ends of weapon. One which is devastating, one which is good for us. You're near a neighborhood. Show Islam what it is. I passed one day in front of my house. Subhanallah. And there's two old couple. This passed by and they just said, where are you, where are you from? And I told them. And they said, well, what is your I said, you know, I'm give talks about the Ah, Iman you are. They said, Iman, not Iman, Iman. That's what, Iman you are. I said, yeah, I mean, you could say that I'm Iman. I said, wait, Palestine I'm from. Oh, we feel pity for you. Look, they are pure English people. I said, why? I said, no, the media is all against you. And we could see how you are under the, the uh, oppression and all of this. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. So they have people who are known what is happening. So don't you ever be, every, you think everybody's brainwashed? No, no, they know. So we feel pity for you. And this is somebody, and then my neighbor as well. She, she, she knows what is happening. So, we can really present Islam other than those people who are the enemies of Allah to try to portray an image which is not the Muslims. Yeah, we do have no good, no good Muslims. That's true. Very bad. It's like a cancer in our body. We have it. I mean, we can't just say uh, everything that's happening, it cannot be, it must be, uh, it must be a plot. No, it can be true. Those idiots, you know, the Khawarij, when they're idiots, then they fight Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then they kill Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. Khalifa. It's Khawarij. They killed Uthman. Khawarij. And when they killed him, Allahu Akbar. It's Islam. They killed the third Khalifa. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar of what? Killing the third Khalifa. These people. Huh? Khawarij. They are from the Muslims. They are they're thinking that Uthman is not a Muslim. And they are better Muslim than him. So don't say that no everything is a plot. No, no. Some of us, our, our, our people, Allah must stand in the name of Islam, they do these things. And of course, the enemies of Allah, they take that as an advantage. They use them. Now, yes. Um, if there's two types of group of people, one is the one who refuses to learn something, even though they've been told in the scriptures that they refuse to learn the scriptures. And then the other category who has supposedly learned it, but they've learned it from the Hassan or Makiriya, 
which of these is more ignorant is one of the ignorant ones that we know? So one who refuses to learn Tawheed, and he's saying La ilaha illallah, and he refuses to learn what is the shirk. In general, we could say this person, he is basically close to leave the deen. I'm not saying the cap which is the Kalim. Maybe he's polluted that the Tawheed that is being put these days is not the correct Tawheed. And maybe he says that the shirk that is being taught to me is not the correct shirk. So he believes going to Jilani and the grave is part of the Tawheed. So he doesn't want to learn your type of Tawheed. He doesn't learn to learn to, to, to leave your type of shirk. True or not, that's the one you're talking about. We'll deal, we'll deal with them as Muslims. On the day of resurrection, Allah will deal with them, whether a kafir or a Muslim. But we'll deal with them. We will deal with them as a Muslim, but they said the Kalim. Okay? But if they, we, we said to them, Allah... Is the creator? He said, No, he's not the creator, he's a kafir. Allah is the one to be worshipped alone. He said, he said, No, if you worship somebody, the kafir. But he doesn't want to learn the tawheed that maybe you are trying to push as a people of the Sunnah. So we say to them that they are in the danger. But we treat them as a Muslim. But on the day of Azar Allah knows with them. And the other one who knows it, but they know it from different uh, different sects, sects of the Muslims, they learn it from the Shia or the Jahmiya and all of that, and they learn it from them. Are they excused by the ignorance, for example, is a question? Mm -hmm. That depends as well. So if this person, he himself in his heart, thought that this is the haq, and nobody else had showed him what is the haq, then definitely we will give him the benefit of uh, excuse. 100%. Because even the person who does innovation, as the Slechir sometimes he said, Rubba ala An innovator, he might be rewarded for his bid'ah. How can the innovator reward for his bid'ah? A person who thinks and believes that this act is getting him closer to Allah because his Sheikh Ash'ari or Sheikh Sufi taught him this. And he has nobody to tell him that this is batil. So he got sincerity, and that sincerity of his, okay, got him that reward. The sincerity of that man who had been fearing Allah to make his children to burn him, he got sincerity. He's sincere to Allah. He doesn't make it. He's afraid of Allah. He, he fears nobody except for Allah. He didn't afraid for somebody else. Just Allah. But he's ignorant. So this one is fearing Allah. He wants to get closer to him by shaking his head. Because the Sufi told him that this is the best. He get drunk and uh, the remembrance of Allah, the dhikr of Allah. Nobody told him that this is hallucination, wrong. So he might be rewarded for that because he didn't have a people to, to tell him. Okay. So Prophet he said, Ma yasma'ubi. Any person who hears about me from Yahudi or Nasrani, Jewish, Christian, or anybody else, قال, la bi, he would not believe in me, Allah will make Jannah haram upon him. So you have to hear now about the Prophet ﷺ from what? The authentic sources. So if you hear about the Prophet of Allah from not authentic or dodgy or distorted, do you understand me like from the Shia or Afidah? You heard about the deen, okay? So you will be exempted. So even the ones who are, did not say La ilaha illallah, never once he said La ilaha illallah and he was the wrong path. He will be excused. How? The only the day of resurrection, he will not, Allah will not put him in the hellfire directly. He will test it. It's an excuse. Why they were tested? Because they were ignorant. No message came to them. Or the message came to them from what? Distorted sources. Polluted sources. Around them, it's all of it. Media, media, kufur, Islam is no good, Islam, terrorism, Islam is terrorism. Yeah, they had no chance to buy a book, which is from the Muslim. They had no media source to tell them. They were just being fed like this. Okay, those Allah he will excuse them not to put them in the hellfire, but he will give them a test on the level of action, special test for them because they did not hear about the Islam correctly. So, how about the Muslims who says La ilaha illallah, but they've learned their deen or their methodology from, like you said, sources which are Sha'ira, Jahmiya, Maturidiyya, and all of those? They definitely have an excuse as well. Now, what do we um, say about? Extremist groups. What is extremist groups in your mind? Uh, how are you? What is the question? What is the extremist group? Is what? 
So what, 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 the question is now, what is the extremist group is what? Of course. Any Khawarij, we don't say it's not Muslim. As Ali al-Talib, he said, Min al-Kufri Farah. They fled from the Kufr. They're running away from the Kufr to go and cut the neck of Uthman and Affan. They will fled away from the Kufr to fight Ali and Nabi Talib. They fought Ali and they hate both, Ali and Uthman. They, they wanted to, they are Khawarij. So they are Khawarij. And Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said that they have left, the, they're running away from the Kufr. And we can't say the Kufar. We could say they are deviated. They are saying they're going to be Kilabu Ahlil Nar, but not Kufar. The dogs are the far, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called them. But this Kufar, we can't say it's Kufar. He says, La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. And he went to verses which are meant Allah for the Kufar and they implemented upon the Muslims. Islam, They kill the Muslims and they leave the one who idolaters. They would say the idolater has got a shubuhat. Doubtful, they can't really kill him. But the Muslims have no shubuhat. Let me kill him. Look at that. <laughs> Look at the categorization. Uh, they kill the Muslims and they don't kill the Muslims. So they have, for example, a checkpoint. Who are you? Christian, pass. <laughs> Jewish, pass. Hindu, pass. Muslim, what do you believe? Oh, you don't believe in us? Kill him. <laughs> That's how it is. These are the people who follow the Khawarij and the extremists. Allah al Musta'an. Naam. Fadl. Ignorance being excuse if you have access to knowledge, but you choose not to. Okay. If ignorance is excuse, if you had access of knowledge and you did choose not to take, take that access, now it depends upon why you didn't take that access. <laughs> is it because you were scared that this access is not correct? Depends. But if you thought it is correct, then it is your cat. Because you are putting, you're talking about non Muslim. It's generally got access to knowledge. Because the difference between non Muslim and Muslim. <laughs> if he's a Muslim, la ilaha illallah, and he's doing bid'ah, and in the bid'ah, and there's an access of source of haq. So why did you take the access? Either he believes that this is access wrong, like we told the brother, wrong. So he's excused. But if he thought it's correct, then he will be punished for his bid'ah. He's still a Muslim. As for the kuffar, same thing here. We say to them that if they are ignorant of where the haqq is, they didn't hear about the Prophet of Allah, they didn't hear about Islam properly, and they had a source, there's a channel somewhere, in the hundreds of millions of channels, there's a Muslim channel there, for example. And he chose not to steer. Is it because he's scared of it, because dodgy? Then he will still be uh, in those people who could be tested. He's a kafir. For us, he's a kafir. But he will be tested. But if he thinks, no, I don't want to listen to it because the kuffar, remember what he used to do? Put their fingers into what? Into their ears. They don't want to listen to the haq. They know it's haq. So he didn't see the haq channel because of his ignorance. And then these people are kuffar. They will stay kuffar and they will be in the hellfire. Do you understand? We have to, to differentiate between two things, Yaqwan. Between us, how we deal with the person and how he's going to be on the day of Radha Rash. The hypocrites, the one who are major hypocrites at the time of the Prophet of Allah, they used to say, La ilaha illallah. But Allah supposed their heart to be what? Kafir. Okay? And uh, the, they, they say la ilaha illallah. So they die and they did not expose what is in their heart. Those people, we treat them as Muslims. Because here we, we, we are treating the people what, what is outward for them. I don't know what is in your heart. You don't know what's in my heart. So if you die as, we you know, the Muslim, khalas, we go and bury you. I'm sorry. Maybe in the hereafter you're not a Muslim. They will treat you outwardly. There's no such thing now. Uh, uh, it's either kufr or Islam. As Umar Khattab, he said, hypocrisy at the time of the Prophet. But now we deal with you as what? What we see from you. Do you understand me? We see from you Islam, we treat you as a Muslim. See from you kufr, we say kufr. But we don't have, for example, a kafir pretends to be a Muslim because we don't know. The Prophet of Allah, he knew. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he knew. That's why he told the Prophet of Allah, وَلَا تُصَلِّ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ مَا تَمِنْهُمْ أَبَدًا وَلَا تَقُمْ عَلَىٰ قَبْرٍ Don't pray on them. Why? Because those people are kuffar. Allah has told you they are kuffar, hypocrites. But remember the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was asked to fight those hypocrites, he said, do you want the people to say, Muhammadun yaqtulu ashaba? Prophet Muhammad is killing his own companions because they look like companions, those people. They're like companions, dressed up and go to the masjid. Now, does that answer your questions? Yes, have you? Right. Any, other, any other question? Right. From the Mas'ud, Fadal. Uh, give them authority. Uh, 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 
check if uh, Ahmed happy is okay. Uh, off the topic because we do we, we I go ahead. Uh, Sheikh, if the sister go for Umrah right, uh, and her monthly period, can she do besides Tawaf? Can she do to uh, Sa'i and uh, uh, Sa'i? Uh, if, uh, if a sister, if a sister what? If a sister what? Goes for Umrah right, uh, and she she's in her monthly period, but she can do everything else besides. She, she has got her monthly period, and she gone to Umrah. Yes. And can she can besides the Tawaf? Can she do the the Safa and Marwa like the Sa'i? Beside the tawaf, she can't do tawaf. Yeah, you understand that she can't do tawaf. Yeah, you said she can't do tawaf. Yes. Right, right. Yeah, she cannot do tawaf. She cannot do salah, and also the correct opinion, she cannot do sa'i and marwa. She cannot. And anyway, you cannot do sa'i before tawaf. You have to understand that. Always in the umrah, you start with the tawaf, then the sa'i. You cannot make the sa'i before the tawaf. And you're saying in this case you do it. The only way to make tawaf before the sa'i or sa'i before the tawaf is tawaf al ifadah in hajj. Tawaf al ifadah. Why? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when a person came to a messenger of Allah, I threw the stone before I made tawaf. No problem. I came in my way. So he, he had made one before the other. Those five things to be done on the day. Uh, but why is it? I've got no power, my way. Huh? I've got no power, Ikhwan. So now you're giving me the power, subhanAllah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how you stingy you guys you are? <laughs> you don't want to give me had even that little bit of power. <laughs> <laughs> subhanAllah, I just found out now. <laughs> I almost lost you because of no electricity here. So uh, I, I said, because of Tawaf at the day of Hajj, which is the day of Eid al-Adha, Prophet of Allah had a man, he said, I did this before this, it's no problem. I made a shave before I threw, no problem. In this, the scholar, they said, no problem to make your sa'i before your Tawaf. But not the Tawaf al-Qudub, not Tawaf al-Umrah. You can't make sa'i before Tawaf. So that, that question of yours has been answered now. No, she cannot do the sa'i. Number one, because she can't make the sa'i before the tawaf. Number two, uh, uh, I follow the, uh, the opinion of that the sa'i also needs to be for you to, to for the woman to be on tahara. Because Allah Azza wa Jal, He said, فَمَنْ حَجَّ الْبَيْتَ وَاعْتَمَرَ فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْهِ أَيَّ طَوَّفَ بِهِنَا He called the sa'i between Safa and Marwa, tawaf, tawwafa bayna. So he was in the tawaf, so he gave it the same rules as tawaf. Wallahu alam. Now, yalla, if anybody wants another question, I had a, any person with a question regardless of what is the question or problem, inshallah. I had, I had Zuhra, I had a question before. Yeah, Tadar is Zuhra. My question is about Tahiyatul Masjid. <clears throat> if you go to the Masjid just to pray and you come back out, do you need to do Tahiyatul Masjid? If you went out for the sake of going out, yes, you need to do it. But if you've gone out for the sake of something like <coughs> there's a car parking wrongly outside the masjid and you want to take the registration number. I'm not saying this is the, as a something real, but this is an example. Okay. So something parking outside. So I went outside, take a picture and come inside. I don't need to do the masjid. If the toilet of the masjid is outside, not part of the masjid, I need to go to make wudu there or relieve myself and come back, there's no tahit al-masjid. There's only tahit al-masjid if I departed physically and mentally, physically and intention-wise, okay? But what I meant was once you said that if you're not going to sit down, you don't need to do tahit al-masjid. Yeah, so my right. question is, if you go to the masjid, you pray and you leave, surely the sitting down in the salah is not considered sitting down. First of all, your question, the first one, was it answered or not? Is it a different question? This is. I'm confused now. Yeah, I, I, I didn't understand the answer. My question is, if I'm passing by a mosque and I need to pray, I go in and I pray and come back out, do I need to do Tahitul Masjid? Because I've just gone in to pray. Okay. I haven't because gone the in to question sit of yours, talk. The question is different now. The question, the first one I've, done, I've answered, inshallah, will be beneficial to other people. Ikhwani, Tahitul Masjid, it means... I cannot sit down without praying. But you said you just prayed. That prayer of yours is considered part of the Ta'it al-Masjid. Even if you okay. pray. 
with the Imam. So if you pray Dhuhr with the Imam, it doesn't mean after I finish the Dhuhr, I need to go and what? I pray Tahit al Masjid. There's no Tahit al Masjid. Tahit al Masjid has been intended to be there just for you not to sit until you pray. So if you pray Dhuhr, no Tahit al Masjid. If you pray the Asr, you pray the Sunnah, do you understand me? There's no Tahit al Masjid. No. Even if you do it by yourself, not without, not with the imam. Is that what you said? I missed that bit. Even if you did it with, by me, yourself, you, ask, you don't need. Your question is not needed. I said to you, the Hayat al Masjid was made for you not to sit in the masjid until you pray. Did I say pray Jama'ah, pray in your own? Until you pray. Okay. Okay. Until you pray. So if you Which pray the... any type of prayer, then that is considered uh, enough for you not to have the Hayat al Masjid compulsory upon you. Khalas. But, but if you're not praying for obligatory, I advise if you're praying voluntary, if you let's say pray, you want to pray the two sunnah dhuhr because you've got enough time till the dhuhr imam, the imam makes the jama'ah. I would say do al masjid first, then the two sunnah dhuhr after that. Okay, if you have time, if you haven't got time except for two rakah, then make this two rakah with the intention of al masjid and plus. Lump into it as an intention wise, the two sunnah of Dhuhr. And if you've done just wudu, you just lump into it three intentions. You're going to get, mashallah, reward for each intention. Tahit al masjid, plus sunnah al wudu, plus sunnah al Dhuhr. Three in one. Only with Allah. Only with Allah. Jazakallah khaira. Now, Ahmad, Fadali Ahmad, last question. Ahsan alaykum, Shaykh We have two questions from the sisters that are written. One of them is if a woman is traveling and she finishes her menses, and there are no facilities for her to make ghusl until perhaps the next day. She's asking, is wudu going to be enough? Say that again. Do you understand the question? Huh? Yeah, yeah. He didn't understand it. Go on. A woman is traveling and finishes her menses, and there are no facilities for her to make ghusl until perhaps the next day. Is wudu sufficient? Yani, uh, she's got enough water to make uh, wudu, hasn't she? Yeah, she's saying she doesn't have the facilities. I think she means a uh, place to shower or wash. Uh, in, in such a case, she makes if she hasn't got the facility, but well, I don't know why because I don't know this is a question I'm ask and answering it according to the extreme circumstances. Okay, <clears throat> okay, so for example, let's say she's on board of the plane. And her mess is stopped. And it's now Dhuhr and Asr. And she's going to China. It's a long trip. And you're going against the sun. That means the time goes very quickly. So she has to have now to pray Dhuhr and Asr. Because she's going to land maybe after Isha. <laughs> after the time of Isha in China. Because you're going against the sun, remember. Uh, so she hasn't got facility to uh, make the ghusl. But she's got tap to make wudu. What should she do? Let's let's tayam. Tayammum. Yes, of course. To find somewhere to make tayammum. Okay, we are on the plane now. I don't think anybody can be carrying stones there or sand. <laughs> I don't know. I've seen a have you seen a, a plane made of tiles? <laughs> okay, so well, I haven't got anything to make tayammum with. I haven't got anything to make tayammum with. What should I do? I'm gonna do my bohran answer. I've got just the water. And by the way, don't tell this to the airline, but I know once I had a, a shower inside it. Don't tell that to the airline. <laughs> I had a shower in one of the toilets. I could tell you the airline says, so the airline, mashallah, the toilet is really massive. It's massive. It's about three toilets together. Three toilets together. Yeah, I could, no, no, it's about three toilets. I'm talking about in about... Two meters by two meters, a bit bigger than my toilet in my house. Okay, and I had water, and I just throat in myself, and I had a shower. Okay, the shower for the for the uh, for the uh, umrah. Okay, because I'm just close to the area. I said, I'm a shower there, and and then I brought the t t sort of uh, tissues, and I wiped all the water that came out of it. As long as you have shower, which is the shower of the Prophet of Allah, I mean very little, because shower of the Prophet of Allah is two and a half bottles of this. Okay. No, no, four bottles of this, like that. I could, you could have a shower, a with this, alhamdulillah. 500 So when you, come, when you go to your body, your body is going to absorb the water. The water is going to come out very little. 
Not that much. Alhamdulillah. So you don't have, coming to the question, you, she doesn't have something to make tayammum. So you make tayammum, that's the first answer. Correct. You got tayammum there. I'm going to extreme now. No tayammum. I've got enough water to have ghusl and wudu, but she hasn't got the facility. She's in this small uh, Ryan Air. You know Ryan Air? Ryan Can't Air. even put your foot there. Never mind. So get a toilet. Get, get a half a toilet in Ryan Air. <laughs> now, what's she going to do? Yalla. Yeah, yeah. What is she going to do? Just intention. No, no, we'll do nothing. No, no, I'm just, no, I'm just saying. She hasn't got in, in, in term. Of, she, can she make wudu? Is it enough or not? Yes? Okay, this follows a different. Is the wudu, if there's no tayammum, can I make a wudu in that area? I think Allah will have say, what the Allah must have taught Fear Allah as much as you can. Wudu. There is no water. What she should do? No water. No, I can't wipe the seats. <laughs> then do exactly what the companions had done when they made salah without anything. No tayammum, no water, nothing. Because they didn't know about the tayammum. Okay, so he just make her intention and make her salah because she doesn't have any water, no facility for ghusl, no tayammum area. That's uh, that's extreme. I don't think anybody can ex ask me more than extreme than this. So you could just you have to make the salah. You can't just adjourn it. There's no option for you to say, I will pray it when I go to China. Well, the time Maghrib is going to kick in. You have to do Dhuhr al Asr before Maghrib. Now. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam wa subhanahu oh, For a second question, sorry, Ahmed. Jazakallah khairan, Shaykh. A sister's written that if a sister has missed fasting in Ramadan when they were young, they delayed making those fasts up, and now they are ill and they are unable to fast. If they die, do their children have to make up their fast, she asked. First of all, the answer quickly, no. Secondly, because the only fast that can be made up is only the vow fast, not the fast which is actually Ramadan. Why did they miss? Mother, the sister is not with you. Well, these questions, Yani Ahmed. Sorry, Sheikh. She sent me a message saying the question is not about a sister, but it's from a sister. It's just a person who fa didn't fast. <laughs> that doesn't answer my question. I'm not really. I don't know who's the sister. So I'm not blaming anybody, Ahmed. For me too. <laughs> I thought you were going to give me. The question is supposed to be, before you put it forward, what was the reason for the person to not to fast when he was young? And how young we are? What is young? If it was young, it could be, for example, 10, 11, 12. I don't know. Once you have reached your puberty, that, that's going to be questioned for your fast. Then you have to fast. Why did she, didn't she? So the question is, this question shouldn't be even asked because it's not clear. So why did she not fast when she's young? How old when she was saying she's young? Why didn't she compensate all these years? Oh, why, why, why? And then we'll answer. But in general, I would say to the person, no one can compensate your missed fast after your death. It's only the fast of the vow. If you vow to fast some days and you died, then somebody has to fast on behalf of you because it's a debt. It's like paying a debt back. Other than that fast, you cannot fast okay could you can do nothing just make you ask yes. Allah to forgive them why or to have an excuse that excuse them is exact valid inshallah right. Subhanakallah. Sheikh, no. sorry Sheikh. um she's written that it's a man who didn't fast and he was lazy he said young what is young I Where think, is young coming? <laughs> I think they mean that he's a man now let us stop the class here Sheikh a man who did not, a person who is was responsible for his fast, if he did not fast, and yet he had postponed it deliberately and did not repent, he's going to be questioned by the Almighty. But as I said, nobody can compensate. I've answered the question, Ya Ahmed, I've answered it. But nobody can compensate that for it. But in terms of repentance, then we would say that this person, if he hasn't repented to Allah, he's going to be questioned. If he repented to Allah, and then suddenly he died before he had fasted. He got ill and he died. Inshallah, Allah Azza wa Jal will take that as an excuse. Subhanakallah, bihamdi. Jazakallah khairan, Shaykh.